Hello everyone. Yes, I am back. It's been quite a bit since I've sat down and filmed a video. I felt I needed to take a little bit of a break and I knew that Katy Perry's album Smile, which is what I'm going to be reviewing today, uh, which came out last Friday, um, I knew that I would return around when I would put out this review. So because this is finally getting put up a little bit late, but it is coming up, there will be more reviews quickly to follow. So uh, I should be in September getting back into the swing of things. So uh, yeah, Katy Perry, her fifth studio album titled Smile. We had so many singles come out before this album officially came out and it was even announced. Um, back when Never Really Over, the lead single came out in May of 2019, Katie was sort of like, well, you're getting a new single, but doesn't necessarily guarantee you're getting a new album anytime soon. The story, of course, is, you know, after her last studio album, Witness, was dubbed a commercial failure, which, you know, unfortunately, I think Katie took that too much to heart. She, you know, kind of wanted to have a reset and like really kind of refocus and think about where she wanted her career to go. She has found her fiance, Orlando Bloom. They, they were on, then off, then on again. And they have now had their first child, Daisy Dove Bloom, who miraculously was born two days before this album dropped. So last week, Katie not only put out an album, but she gave birth to a baby, which as far as big female pop artists, I don't think many of them can boast that on their accolades uh, of giving birth twice in one week, so to speak which I'm sure Katie did not want to be necessarily the case because that's a lot to have happen. Um, but, you know, unfortunately, I think her baby was kind of late. I think it was supposed to come early August. And uh, this album had actually been delayed quite a bit. Um, it was supposed to come out in June, but I think the pandemic along with her pregnancy kind of interrupted things. But she also wanted to make sure she did kind of finish and put out the album before she, you know, was a full-time mother. Uh, which I think some people uh, argue is sort of to the detriment of the album. They feel it's a bit unfinished, that some more time marinating and ruminating over it could have been beneficial. And, uh, well, you'll hear my thoughts as I get through this track list. But uh, I will say this, the general consensus, unfortunately, um, from critics and even from quite a few Katy Perry fans that I've seen is that this album is far from her best. Uh, some have been very harsh in their critiques, uh, particularly, you know, mainstream critics. They're definitely being hard on her this time around, which I don't really think is whole, just wholly justified. I think that Katie was an artist that I never took that seriously. And so in some ways that is working to her benefit here, which I think some of these critics need to sort of remember. Um, she's not going to deliver something that groundbreaking. You know, she kind of is the formula of pop music. And you know what? Is that necessarily a bad thing? Because this album, it's it's very innocent and lighthearted. Um, and it fits with the sort of narrative of an, a lighthearted Katy Perry album. I think, you know, when she wanted to embrace purposeful pop on her Witness album, she kind of wanted to say, my music's going to have a little bit more of an edge and more of a statement to it this time around. But what we got lyrically was all over the place. And I personally, in my review, and many others agree that there was not a whole lot of politics or anything kind of groundbreaking going on in the lyrics to that record beyond maybe a couple um, very vague references in there. So I think that Witness was a misstep in the fact that it was mis mislabeled or mischaracterized by her as we were approaching its release. And so this time around, this album hasn't really come with a whole lot of fanfare from her or her label. She's not really hyping this album up to be more than it is, which I really appreciate because I think maybe she understands that that might be leading to the high expectations that she cannot really achieve, which is that really a fault on her part or is it just the pop landscape at this point is done with Katy Perry and whatever she does, she is going to be uh, undervalued or, you know, mischaracterized or told that she's not fitting the box that they'd like her to be fitting into. So I really feel for Katy Perry because I do think that she's in her mid to late 30s now and she is about to be a new mom and she's entering into a stage where a lot of careers for women that were of her caliber start to decline 
it just, unfortunately, it's the nature of the beast that we live in in pop music. I've talked about this in all of the reviews of all of these would-be huge hit singles that potentially could have been really big again. There's nothing about Smile or Never Really Over or even Harley's in Hawaii that inherently I feel like are bad songs in that they're so bad they wouldn't get played on radio. Like something is not quite matching here. And I've heard a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of conspiracy theories about Capitol Records being, you know, sabotaging her, not sending a lot of these songs to radio. I think Daisy's, you know, was in the top 10 for like four weeks and then dropped drastically and it never got sent to radio. So the momentum never built, which a lot of people I think think could have happened if her team and her label had like actually gotten their, you know, gotten their S together, so to speak. Um, and so I really do feel for her in that regard. I don't know how much of that is on Katie's directive herself, but the promotion just is not there beyond a Target back to school commercial featuring Smile, which I have to admit has sort of co-opted that song to become the song of the summer, but not in the way that I necessarily had hoped it would, because that's all people are going to think about when they hear that song now, um, is, yeah, the only kind of bit of promo we are actually seeing for this record. And so this album, a lot of people were like, I didn't even know what was happening. Like, it just really flew under the radar, especially for a Katy Perry record. But again, looking back at Witness, I think that, you know, maybe Katy is a little bit weary of putting too much emphasis on her work in the case that it does flop she can say well i didn't you know it's the pandemic and i didn't really put much into it i was pregnant there are a lot of other factors that are coming into play there so look i don't care about charts you know me and i don't really think katie does anymore either i think she realizes that like she wants to be she wants to be taken seriously as an artist and as a songwriter um, now, I don't think that this is the album to do that for her, which I was hoping might be the case, but I also kind of got the vibe that this still was going to be sort of like a bit of a last gasp of just an all-out fun pop record from her that I'm hoping she will take the step to embracing a slightly more, well, either going back to her more pop rock aesthetic, but maybe going in a bit more of a darker uh, introspective direction with a little bit more groundbreaking lyricism and subject matter, um, working with different kinds of producers that might not be so expected. Looking at the producers on this project, we've got some familiar faces. We've got Dream Lab, we've got uh, Stargate, we've got Zed from Never Really Over, we've got Charlie Puth, uh, Andrew Goldstein, Josh Abraham. So it's it's a lot of the Swedish delegation, as we like to call them, the, you know, hit makers from Stockholm. And I think that Katie is really being bogged down by the producers that she's working with. Um, at this point, you know, she is sort of retreading territory she's done before on Teenage Dream and on Prism. This album feels very much like a sister project to those two albums, somewhere in the middle. Um, it doesn't quite have the bombast and like the iconic in-your-face lyrics and wittiness and cheekiness that Teenage Dream had. Um, however, it also isn't taking itself as seriously as Prism did. So it's somewhere in the middle. Um, and as a Katy Perry record goes, I, again, where were, people where were people's expectations here? Again, maybe it's just a result of me already sort of being dis disillusioned by mainstream pop at this point that I almost can't be that disappointed because I've already been disappointed so much by a lot of mainstream pop. Um, Never Really Over, the lead single, I've already reviewed in a track review, so I'm not really going to talk too much about it, but I really do feel like this is the sort of poster child song for the album, and it's unfortunate to look back at when that song debuted over a year ago and the hype that was kind of building from it. A lot of people, this is the best song on the record for them, and I can appreciate it as, you know, it's the one Zed moment. It's also the one Dream Lab moment. It's definitely different from the rest of the album. It's got a different rhythm, a different structure. It's going somewhere very 80s, but it's also trying something different for Katie. But it still feels very much like something that could belong on her previous records. The formula works for her in her favor here. 
And uh, it's also just got a really powerful chorus that can get really stuck in your head. The message behind it is something that could really fit on mainstream radio and be relatable to everyone. So there was nothing that I think this song was meant to fail by the fact that it was just a good song, besides the fact that I think ageism and sexism and possible sabotaging by Capitol Records caused it to fall by the, by the wayside and not become the huge hit that a song like Roar was, for example. Um, and so it's unfortunate the song got kind of swept away. But I will say this. I was very, very concerned that all of these singles that she'd put out were not even going to be on this studio album, the final product. And there are some very questionable omissions from this final 12-track album. However, I will talk about adding songs as the deluxe version. There are a few songs that have been tied back in, the remaining ones, and thankfully. But they shouldn't have been on the deluxe. They should have been on the standard. They should have swapped out a few other songs. Um, Cry About It Later... It's a perfectly harmless, fun song. Uh, it's nothing revolutionary as far as pop goes. And uh, I don't really have a whole lot to say beyond that I definitely enjoy listening to it. When it comes to most of these songs, I love putting it on, love the rhythm, the feel. Some of them have a very pop upbeat attitude to them. Um, the album I've heard is definitely kind of structured in some way around like three songs each being about a different stage. Um, the first three songs are sort of like the most, I think, I don't want to say negative because they're quite upbeat, but they're coming from a place that's kind of like post breakup dealing with, you know, dealing with difficult hardships in terms of a relationship. They're coming from a place where you're feeling a lot of pent up emotion and you sort of just want to exercise it out. And so the same carries through with Teary Eyes, which is a new disco attempt that I think Dua Lipa does a lot better with than uh, what we get here. Uh, it's a song that I want to like, but there's something that just does not fire on all cylinders for me with this track. Both songs, Cry About It Later and Teary Eyes, have a feeling of going to the club when you're really feeling that pent up you know, anger and emotion over a failed relationship or a relationship that's going south. Um, so, you know, sweat it away to the beats of the disco, which is a theme tried and true. And, you know, I <laughs> have nothing really negative to say inherently about that, including in that in the story of this album. Um, but again, it's something we've heard so much before. And I do think the production really does hinder these songs to a certain ex to a certain extent especially teary eyes the fourth track daisies the lead single from this album even though it was technically the fourth or fifth single released before the record dropped don't understand the lingo there this is a song that i really want to love but i am sorry this song just really isn't it for me this song has just had no real replay value for me unfortunately I think that the the vocal octave jumps just really don't add anything to the song for me because it feels like you're building to something that is really going to crash down upon you, but then the chorus just sort of reverts to and ends abruptly with going back to a mid tempo uh, mid tempo bridge or a mid tempo verse, and so it, it's an unwelcome transition for my ears, and so that's the biggest critique I have for this song. Um, I wish that there had been a bit more of a seamless transition into the um, back to the verses, but the platitudes just they don't really they don't really leap off the page. It's just lyrics we've heard before. Again, lyrical analysis here. I think there's only a few songs towards the end that I really want to get into it because there's there are lyrics you could see on any motivational poster with a picture of daisies in a field, you know? And again, I'm not really going to come too hard on Katie for that because have I really ever been that blown away by her songwriting like lyrically before? Not, not often. Um, and in a lot of ways, I think Katie as more of the full package. It's more about the combination of lyrics that are maybe not that attention grabbing, but suit a theme that she's running with. And they are set to really great pulsing production or some sort of ecstatic chorus with some cool vocal elements, some good layering. That all kind of comes together in the and, and creates a package that can be replayable and great for like 
exercising and giving yourself a positive boost. Um, most of these songs are not exactly really uh, leaving me kind of with my jaw on the floor. Let's just put it that way. Um, and Resilient is probably one of the most disappointing because that's a song that you know just based by looking at the title that it's meant to be such a um, momentous occasion for the record. You know, it's meant to kind of get down and dirty. Um, but the sparse sputtering instrumentation is not really selling it for me um, because it's not really giving the song, I think, the space to be epic. Um, instead, it's keeping things like sort of staccato and lighthearted, which I think contrasts with the moments in the vocals and the lyrics where she's trying to really drive a point home about strength. These songs, Daisies, Resilient, and Not the End of the World, I think represent the lowest or the point where she felt like she needed when she was experiencing her depression, like really turn things around. Like, I am strong. I can get over this. This is the kind of more empowering section of the record. And um, only Not the End of the World is actually any a song that gives me any sort of emotional feeling of resilience. Uh, even though Not the End of the World is definitely a more modern, you know, almost, almost hip-hop influx up and trap take on that emotional drama, there's something there that actually kind of elevates it for me. Um, whereas Resilient... Um, I am resilient. I am brilliant. I'm going to grow right through the cracks. I'd be interested to hear a more acoustic version of this song for sure, because it's the one song that I think she could really vocally prove herself um, because the chorus is trying to do that. Um, but the way it's just mixed in this, the way it's composed and you know presented to us here uh, is just wanting a lot to be desired for me. So speaking of not the end of the world, um, the song has, I actually think, quite a welcome uh, vocal sampling for the hit song from the 60s called Kiss Him Goodbye by Gary DiCarlo. Uh, not many of us know the name of the song, but we all know that iconic um, chorus line. And so uh, I think her in introducing that into the melody, it does prop up the song for me, even though it's not her own original thing. Um, you know, there's there's an art to sampling, and I do think it takes a certain level of creative input to know when's the right time to artfully introduce something recognizable to the audience. And so I do give her a little bit of credit for introducing that, although it might not have been her idea solely, um, including that it just gives the song a little bit of a boost in terms of memorability, which it desperately needs. Um, but that's the problem, though, because I'm like, if you take that part out of it, then it is just sort of this haphazard collection of, of beats and attempts at rapping at parts. Like, it's a bit more fast-paced in her delivery. And probably with the most modern production, the title track, Smile, you know... <sighs> A lot of people would call this song very banal, and I could agree with them, but there is something so infectious about it. And I don't know if the commercial and like hearing it just in that kind of aesthetic is helping or it's, uh, you know, making this song, I, I don't know. It just, it actually feels like for what it's meant to do, it's doing pretty well for me. You want a sing-along, fun, catchy song with trumpet uh, from Katy Perry? Here you go. I mean, the song is called Smile, so when you're saying something so on the nose, might as well go all the way camp with it. The album art is this kind of like sad clown in a circus, like realizing that like being told to smile can be quite a chore, but like we're going to, you know, pick ourselves up and do it. And I think that the aggressive positivity of this song, which I know can be a bit forthcoming for some people um, and also very cheesy, I think it actually pays off and it's actually one of my favorite songs on the record. I think I love the visuals she's given us for it where she's kind of pretending to be this clown figure and it's it's a little children's TV in parts. But I think uh, alluding to that sort of basic childlike emotion around happiness and, you know, endorphins and smiling and clowns and circus, I think that actually really works in her favor on a record that is kind of very bare bones and cheesy in that regard. Um, because it's like, she's aware of it. She's kind of self-aware um, and almost kind of just poking fun at a concept that if you wanted to, you know, run with, then 
it actually kind of, it gives the album a little bit of a concept um, that I think otherwise would have made the record just feel extremely inauthentic and like plastered. I don't know what the right, better word for that is. Um, don't get me wrong. It's nothing extraordinary, but this song is extremely, extremely catchy. will get stuck in your head like nothing else. And, um, it really puts a pep in your step, which, you know, we could all use a little bit of that right now, but the argument I see against it is that it is very, it's a very shallow attempt at empowerment. And that's something that could be, you know, in, that could be cast over many of these songs. And so I can understand why a lot of people are disappointed. But me personally, she wants to run with a bit of a childlike interpretation and an innocent interpretation of what it feels like to feel good and how to make that happen. Then, hey, I'm all for it. Um, champagne Problems. We got problems with this song. That's for sure. This song is definitely one that could have been swapped out for a song that definitely showed growth and maturity, which is Never Worn White, a song I deeply love. One of my favorite songs from this whole era, if not my favorite. I am really, really disappointed that this song got okayed and that song got axed because I have no idea whose decision that was, but they need to reevaluate their taste because it just, this, this song is very throwaway. Um, I've heard, you know, uh, reviewers talk about, you know, Megan Trainer, like that kind of plastic pop, bubblegum pop that's meant to sort of be a girl's anthem, but it just, no one actually is really listening to it at parties. It's, it's not actually a song that anyone's going to actually play, um, but it's pretending it's, it's that. And I just, I don't, I don't buy this. It. It's, it's not for me. Tucked, which I also think could have been more aptly labeled, labeled tucked away because I've been watching a lot of Drag Race. So I can't think of just saying tucked without alluding to like, you know, like <laughs> drag and like tucking. So it's a little hard for me to dis disentangle that from that title. Um, but she is so uh, infectious on this one. Um, it's something that's growing on me for sure. I got like a bit of a Beach Boys guitar like line going behind it. It's got a breezy feel to the chorus. And um, it definitely, it sounds like something that could have easily fit alongside other songs like This Is How We Do and International Smile off of Prism. It's, it's following in that lane. And those songs are nothing extraordinary, but they're really fun. And they, they sell the bubblegum aesthetic actually really well. So I have a lot more uh, affinity for Tucked than I do for Champagne Problems. Though both songs, like I said, nothing extraordinary. So where I will disagree with a lot of people is that I think Harley's in Hawaii is a legit jam. A lot of people think this song is like almost in a parody level of bad and cringe. There are some questionable lyrics like cruising down the heart-shaped highway, I don't quite understand that lyric in terms of like the imagery, like you're talking about highways that are shaped like hearts. Like you don't see highways like that. If anything, they're just circles. So I'm a little confused by that line. Um, and the, you know, distinct referencing of Harley's in Hawaii is so actually at odds with the rest of the album, which is very vague and unspecific in a lot of ways. Um, so there's definitely a specificity to this song that actually makes it kind of interesting to me. But this was the song that Charlie Puth produced, and uh, it's very different from the rest of the album because of that. Um, it's it's a uh, it's a sensual, beachy, like margarita on the sun kissed beach kind of track, and um, the the vocal syncopation on it. Um, there's pink and purple in the sky. Yay. There's a really great syncopation to this with the instrumental that makes this song so unique to the rest of the record because it really gets under your skin. Um, and so I think this song is actually really brilliant and I'm giving most of that to Charlie. Um, I'm not a huge Charlie Puth fan, but I'm kind of impressed by this one. I'm, I find it to be just like, it's a great cruising jam on the highway song. And of course the imagery kind of fit alludes to that even. So only love. I want to like this song and I do appreciate it. This is the part of the record. This last part of the record is sort of like the most reflective 
Um, and I think most representative of where Katie is now, like happily engaged to Orlando and about to give birth to her child. Um, and, you know, we do get some insightful lyrics here. You know, she sings about if I had one day left to live, I would talk to my mom and I'd really apologize for like, you know, all of the bad blood that's happened and the rift between us. Um, and she'd talk to her dad again and repair all these bridges and, and look at life so differently. And really, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's a sentiment that I do think we all need a healthy dose of and doing it through, you know, harmless, fun synth pop is definitely not a bad idea. But again, I think that we have had this sold to us and packaged in so many different forms throughout Katie's career and throughout just the history of pop music that it leaves me wanting so much more. It leaves me wanting something that is actually going to make more of an impact than a half-baked synth pop song that has like a very mild chorus. Um, in fact, probably one of the weaker choruses of the record, especially considering, you know, it's a song that's meant to, like I said, be a bit more of a statement centering her kind of moment. Um, but I do appreciate that she's alluding to her past. Um, you know, Katie grew up in a very conservative, um, evangelical uh, Christian family. And so she had a real sort of a sundering from them as she got older. And I think it's been hard for them to repair their relationship. So I think that, you know, her talking about being the bigger person and like realizing what love could build between failed relationships is, is an important sentiment, especially a mature one for someone Katie's age. Um, and that leads us into the closing track, What Makes a Woman, which is a bit shorter, a bit more of an outro. Um, there's definitely a warmth to this song. We've got a little bit more of an acoustic vibe, which I definitely like to hear from her. We don't get so much of that. Um, and the platitudes, again, come into full force here. When we're singing about the mystery and the complexity of what makes a woman a woman, because what is a woman is undefinable. And that is the core and beauty of it. And um, it's nothing new territorially in terms of the lyrics that we've heard from other female pop stars. Um, there's a song by Shakira called When a Woman from her last album, El Dorado, that it reminds me of. Um, and it kind of is the, uh, the same kind of illusion of like, I think in that song, she says she'll take you to hell and back. She's light and dark. She's everything in between. It's that same sort of sentiment. Um, and really it is, it's just, you know, please don't pigeonhole what makes a woman. Now I have the same energy and, you know, uh, attitude towards this, what makes a man as well. And that's a whole other story. But Katie is, you know, a cis woman. So I'm not gonna, you know, I'm not gonna fault her, her lack of, um, you know, uh, flipping the script in terms of gender too, you know, radically, when this song is about her own personal experience. Um, and so I would definitely like to see, see more male artists sing about what makes a man. Um, because I think that that's a topic in gender and toxic mas in masculinity that needs to be talked about more. Um, but all that being said, um, yeah, it's very sing song. It's very cute. Um, and it does close out the album on a softer, introspective, like close to the chest moment, which I think is a great way to wrap things up. Um, however, like I said, I was still a little let down by the fact that it still didn't really take us very far um, in terms of any sort of memorability in the melody line. I do love, you know, the uh, spoken word outro. There it is, Catherine. Is it the way we keep the whole world turning in a pair of heels? That's what makes a woman. There it is, Catherine. Uh, yeah, that there it is, Catherine. I love that she calls herself Catherine. My mom's name is actually Catherine, and they spell it the same way, like the Y-N, so it's kind of unusual. So that just makes me a little bit emotional there. It, it did. It caught me by surprise. I was like, that's a sweet way to end things. Um, I will just give a shout out to Never Worn White, because in my playlist, I have that as song number 13. I think that's a phenomenal way to close out the record. I've reviewed that song, so I will link it in the description, but like that is the wedding song, you know, like it's got such emotion to it and maturity and depth. And uh, I just think the, the energy around that song is so infectious. So I'm really upset that it's not on the main version. Um, I'm not disappointed that small talk was omitted because I didn't really like that one. 
but never worn white being omitted was a very questionable decision. And um, please, you know, put it on the playlist. It, it elevates the album, I think, significantly. Um, it would have helped with the reviews, I think, I think a lot. Um, so yeah, that's, that's Smile. What else is there really to say? I mean, we're in a tough time right now and um, collectively, like with what's going on. And so unbridled optimism can be a little hard to swallow right now. Uh, you know, it's even what we need more than ever. Um, and I definitely understand where the critics and, you know, people are saying that like, this force feeding optimism in a very shallow, basic way just is really banal and tiresome. In some ways, maybe that's just what I've always kind of expected from Katy Perry. Because she said about, she said she was going to make a darker record at one point and never happened. But I'm having a hard time understanding what a really dark album from her would sound like. That being said, I definitely would like to see her next project go more in that territory. Um, but, you know, she's also at a pretty good spot, you know, personally with her personal life. So it's the record I still kind of expect for her to make, given where she is right now. And I still have hope that there's room to explore and to make an album that maybe is nowhere near the commercial success she once achieved, because I'm, I'm afraid that shit may have sailed, sadly. But the sooner that, you know, she accepts that fully, and I think she has, and that we all do, the happier I think we'll be with the output she gives us. Um, and so... Is it her best? No, it's definitely not her best. Um, 10 years after Teenage Dream, it definitely feels like an after, it's a shadow of what she once was in terms of mainstream pop, but it also feels much more mature than Teenage Dream. So there is still that connection and that story that is continuing for her. And I'm not going to bash it like so many others are because of the sheer fact that it is Katy Perry and she is sort of known for being that innocent, bright, colorful pop that we all kind of like to listen to when we're feeling in those moods. Um, and so I don't look for much else beyond that from her. So it's a good and a bad thing, I guess. Let me know your thoughts in the, in the comments and uh, if you agreed or disagreed. Um, and I will see you all on my next review. If you enjoyed, please give this video a like and subscribe if you are new here. I'll see you all in my next video. Have a wonderful, blessed day. Peace, love, and light. Bye.